big funds are being raised, but they all quote unquote complain about the missing deal flow. So we need more project developers. In some sectors, this is a dirty word, but here we need people who are disciplined, who put together the business plan, organize the permits, figure out the seeds or tree genetics, figure out the irrigation equipment, organize the offtake agreements, and wow, it always gets delayed. Don't take any salary or a very low one for a couple of years. All of this to create bankable, investable projects. So the investors, who are usually far away and have never seen an almond orchard or a permanent pasture wheat system, get comfortable and convince their investment committees and their bank colleagues to give the green light. So farm after farm, hectare after hectare can start with the implementation of regenerative practices. It might not be sexy, but it's absolutely crucial. So enjoy this interview with one of those project developers in France. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode today with Boris Spetsky, the founder or one of the co-founders of GreenPods with a long history in let's say, regenerative agriculture, sustainable agriculture finance. I'm very happy to have him on the show. We've known each other for a while, and it's uh, it's finally time to have Boris on the, so- on the show. So welcome. Hi, thank you very much for having me, Ken. And to start with a personal question, what brought you to this space of, um, I mean, from all the different career paths you could have taken in, in, a, in a comfortable office somewhere with a lot of airco, and uh, air conditioning and to be very comfortable instead of out in the field, planting trees, financing trees and, and trying to get this done. What led you to this sector? Uh, I was basically um, given the opportunity to work into agriculture by a friend who was working for a commodity merchant. And then he, he, he told me about uh, a cocoa guy he had met when he was doing his internship on a, on a mill, on a flour mill in Cameroon. And I applied to... Ecom, this was back in 2007, um, to a large commodity merchant, and I applied to join their Central Asia desk. I'd been studying Central Asian and Caucasian studies uh, at St. Petersburg State University, and decided that I maybe could join work and uh, personal interests. So basically, I already have 15 years of uh, experience in uh, agriculture, we could call it agribusiness. Uh, it's a mix between value chain finance and public private partnerships. And I worked on three different continents. So I, I started as a merchant, um, originating cotton in Uzbekistan, uh, shipping 50,000 tons uh, of cotton a year through the port of Bandar Abbas, uh, in, in Iran, shipping it mostly to textile mills in Bangladesh. And given the difficult context back in the days, political context in Uzbekistan, I quickly moved to Tajikistan, where we were invited at the initiative of the Better Cotton Initiative, which was maybe a kind of burgeoning uh, concept of region ag um, to replicate the, the coffee model of a group that prides itself in having more agronomists and the, the merchants on the payroll. So basically provide technical assistance to farmer, increase their, increase their yields, increase their revenues and, pref- and become their preferred off taker. This is where I so I, I didn't come from uh, uh, from the soil. I, I I came more from. We all do, right? And we all go back. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, and I, I came more from the social um, aspect because back in the days, Tajikistan, the farmers were very much in debt after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, a civil war uh, that followed, and they they were. I think their debt, aggregated debt, was four hundred million US dollars to cotton genus to intermediaries, and basically they these guys were prefinancing the the farmers in kind with poor fertilizer, uh, diesel that was cut with water, seeds were given late, 
and of course with a 30 percent or even more predatory interest rates so the european bank for reconstruction and development came in refinanced the farmers at decent interest rates through the banks and they asked that someone actually buys the cotton at the farm gate to make sure that the credit cycle was being closed up. So that's how I started, got acquainted with agriculture. We had lots of agronomists helping the farmers. Uh, then moved to Mexico in 2011, did two years in a coffee, soluble coffee plant. Then did uh, another three years or more in the former Soviet Union in Moscow to sell cocoa products. And then 2015 uh, or 14, actually, the, the war started and uh, Russia invaded Crimea. We came back to Europe. I did my MBA. And this was the emergence of, there was a, a kind of, um, there, there, there was, there was um, how do you, sorry, how do you call it? There was demand for from investors to invest into kind of sustainable land management and agriculture. So you had different funds. You had the initiative of Danone with Livelihood. You had uh, Clément Cheneau with Moringa, who you interviewed. And uh, the UNCC was starting the uh, the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund. So basically, they had been given a mandate by one of the three uh, conventions, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification to basically um, launch and structure a fund that would invest into sustainable land management and revert the trend of land degradation. Land degradation. So these were really five interesting years. I became the investment director for Latin uh, America. Uh, we did some deals in, uh, in, in Nicaragua, in Peru, in Colombia, uh, did other deals in Bhutan as well, mostly tree crops. And this is where basically I think uh, a lot w w was learned. Um, the UNCCD provided us with a very robust uh, scientific uh, framework. And uh, basically you, you started having a, an interesting consensus between civil society, between uh, academia on how to kind of restore lands and between restoration, regeneration, well, I, I think then let's not play on words, but it, it's it's quite similar. So the, the the this is how I came basically to uh, to setting up green parts because after five years we saw that there was maybe more not enough deal flow, more money wanting to flow to Region Ag than actual developers, and with an operating background, and it's it's especially a matter of uh, of personal taste. I felt more compelled to go back to operations than stay as a financier, which are financiers are useful people in the sense that they're the pump of the economy, but it depends on what you think you're best at or what you, maybe not, not even what you're best at, but what you like most. And it was definitely uh, finding, uh, finding land, uh, uh, finding the right irrigation equipment, the right genetics. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's how yeah, I- You say something- Super interesting there on the developing side. You say there's more money that wants to flow than, than projects, um, investable projects to flow into. Um, and, and you happen to really like that development piece, which I think is a very under, um, under spotlighted role in this sector. I mean, we, we've seen it in, in renewable energies where the developers are, have been always the crucial piece to, to put all the different puzzle pieces together and then, then the money will flow. And of course, some people had to take early risk. And now 20 years later or 30 years later, whatever time frame you look at, like that sector exists, but in, in, it seems to be almost in the region, ag and agroforestry space that, that developer role hasn't really been filled yet. Um, and, and we see it sort of emerging. I see multiple people starting to take that role. And, and what, what really, because maybe for people to understand what, what is that role? I mean, you're saying from, figuring out uh, irrigation equipment down to the genetics and buying and figuring out the land. So describe that first uh, project in France that you, you've been on the way now. Like what, what is it like? Uh, let's make it as visual as possible because we are on an audio tour, obviously. And then let's unpack a bit what, what it takes to, to put something like that together and get it financed. Because that's, of course, we, we can make a great PowerPoint, but if we don't get it financed, nothing, no, that, exactly. no trees will be in the ground. Maybe we, we'll get back exactly. This is a very interesting point that the, uh... Ag has never been structured like uh, renewable energy, where at some point 20 years ago, you had project developers come come to financiers and say, look, I've put a data room together. I've got the permits. I know it will work. I've got the technology. 
and it's non-recourse project finance. I've got no money, but I want to stay as a majority shareholder and please finance us with kind of long-term and patient capital to make sure that we go through the J-curve. And this is completely uh, something, project finance, the rules could be applied to um, to ag. So this is what we 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 tried to to do at uh, at La Granja, which is Green Pot's first project. We we kind of uh, actually in the, the team that uh, has set up Green Pot, we all did a stint with the LDN fund. So Green Pot is a fully integrated region ag farm developer specializing in tree nuts and servicing the growing demand for plant based products, providing full traceability back to the farm. So the first farm Lagrangia. Uh, close to Toulouse is France's largest organic almond orchard. And we got certified with the French label by carbon uh, in January with an estimated 4,500 tons. So that's, that's the farm. And the, the, the context was the following. So as you know, agriculture is a major cause of climate change with being responsible for roughly 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. We have 1.3 billion hectares available to feed the world population. We degrade 12 million hectares a year through deforestation, intensive monocropping, and overgrazing. And if you look at France, in France alone, we import 4.5 million tons of soy every year. It's mostly GM uh, in the sense that it comes from uh, the Americas or South America. Um, and, and the same goes for almonds. Nothing to do with GM this time, but we have a consumption of 40,000 tons and we produce less than 1,000. So the, the system because it's work. not the ideal climate or because it's not possible or it's it's possible no, we, it just we, hasn't no, been we, at we, scale we, yeah we, we did have a, a, a larger uh, almond uh production back in days but it's just that you know sometimes you you shift and we've got a lot of land where it could go which is allocated to different things you're in the south of france you see some uh, huge maize fields and i don't think that's the most uh appropriate uh crop to to plant in, in this area in in provence uh, you've got some higher value added uh, crops. So the, the system won't work any longer. And one, we must switch to more plant-based diets and eat more local to leave pressure on land. That's on the... Uh, and on and the, not the, grow the, maize uh, and then it's going to be fed to, to livestock. Yeah, exactly. Probably. And that's yeah. on the, uh, that's on the uh, demand side. And on the supply side, we must transition our agricultural production towards region ag, less pesticide and fertilizer use less water use, more biodiversity, and better farm incomes. This is, I think, the broader accepted definition that's been uh, already kind of carved into stone by uh, OP2B. OP2B. Uh, so, Lagrange... La I, I know people are listening. We, we haven't had them on the show. Like OP2B is the, the Biodiversity Alliance, if I have to. I'll put a link below uh, in, in the, the show notes um, of large... Uh, what is it? Oh, basically, all the large food producers in the world around biodiversity. I think it was launched by the then CEO of Danone. Uh, exactly, Faber. it was Emmanuel Faber, and they had put these videos together with uh, Patagonia. And I think, can we date maybe, at least in France, we always spoke about agroecology, so maybe the sustainable intensification of agricultural production. It was not a re really a fight, but at some point when you've got uh, a company like Patagonia and the kind of marketing uh, genius coming with a, a, a term uh, like region ag and making it you no know, uh, making it spread i think sexy just, yeah <laughs> region ag has has taken over and i think it's a, it's in terms of marketing in, in terms of the message it, it's efficient so and, and let's talk about the the farm then as exactly. what is fundamentally different of course i mean let's let's talk about the, the maize field it replaces and um, of course it's a very different view or a very different image it's very different food and not feed but also compared to a non-organic or a non let's say organic regenerative uh, almond production what, what are the for the for the the non uh, almond geeks what are the differences we could recognize like what would we see differently under your trees, with your trees, around your trees, compared to uh, a non-organic one, where most of it probably comes from now, imported to France. Yeah, I think it's um, the, it's important to discuss the, the baseline as a, in a carbon product. So two years ago, during lockdown, we came across a farm for sale in Toulouse that had been producing conventional corn for 30 years, exporting it to Spain's pork industry. So this French corn was fed to pigs in fattening stations. Uh, these pigs were sent to slaughterhouses and then packed and basically shipped back to the French supermarket shelves. It's, it's a bit crazy, yeah? Far from what you would think of, or oh, as a, uh, as a definition of sustainability. 
it was uh, it's a bit of agroeconomic nonsense uh and actually it, it gives the baseline of the project even in carbon terms so we 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 couldn't buy the farm we we managed to secure the farm through a 25-year lease and it was bought by an insurance company called la maif in france that had a fund dedicated to basically helping young people settle uh on land and they had identified the land purchase uh, land purchase as really a barrier to entry um, which it is yeah yeah it is because we we didn't have two million uh two million euros so that that's for sure so basically we went from that really flat piece uh, of land that had been uh basically uh depleting the soil resources for 30 years and we converted it to first we entered in april 2021 and we started rotating crops again. We planted buckwheat, soy, uh, and sunflower. And then we had winter crops and we planted oats, spelt, winter wheat, and others. So already you try to regain a bit of, uh, of life. And you, you did that to, to have these cash crops or you did it to build up soil life and to prep for the trees? No, we, we, we did it because first of all, we, it was not the purpose just to, to sit back. And of course, the, the, we, out of the 150 hectares, we plan to have uh, 70 hectares of uh, of almonds. So, the it's it's I would call this farm more of a of, of a um, of a tree crop player. Yeah? That's what we concentrate on. That's what we know. And once you've gone, once you reduce your acreage to 70 hectares of uh, annual crops, it's not really worth buying the equipment. So you're 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 giving it to um, to a service provider. Of course, then the margins get eaten. And first of all, on annual crops, if you don't kind of process yourself or integrate downstream operations, it's not extremely profitable. Right? The, the the point is more to get it at break even, and as well as you know, for Regen Ag certification, uh, rock certification, which we're aiming for, Regen Organic certification, you need to rotate several crops. So, uh, of course, we are. Um, we got that lease for 25 years, but one condition of the lease was you convert to organic at year one. So that's what we did. And once you've got 30 years of intensive monocropping and we came in late, so we planted in spring while we had to basically, we were competing with the, with the weeds and uh, it's been very difficult. We, we, we lost money. We had to uh, compete with Datura and Xantium, which are toxic uh, and uh, our soy got contaminated and was declassed from uh, some 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 some, uh, some tons had to go for animal feed and were not fit for human consumption. So the transition, it's true, has a cost because if you leave your if you if if you kind of uh, 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 treat chemically for thirty years, the the the, the day you, you stop uh, applying chemicals, it's party time for your weeds. And if you and we should have maybe planted uh, winter crops before because this year, for example, we planted uh, wheat and, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't germinate at the same time and there's been no competition. The, the wheat is, is perfect. So we're now in conversion takes three years. In France, we call it C1, C2, C3. We're in C2, year C2, and next year we can start selling the uh, organic, basic. Uh, we can start selling our annual crops as organic to the to the co-op. And so this is the uh, annual crop uh, part. But on the 24th of February this year, we planted uh, the first 32 hectares of the orchard. Uh, we, as we've been working on this product for the past two years with basically a good friends, good Spanish friends, and you know them, it's Cristobal Aranega, who runs the nursery Crisara, who used to be the president of Alvelan for a couple of years. They came to the farm several times. We Just to, as a background, I, I don't know them personally, but we've had Common Land, and we've had, of exactly. course, the Spanish it's, project a number of times on it. I will, I will link below some, some interviews. Yeah, some exactly. Minutes. So this is the, the, the man who runs the nursery, uh, which has provided many plants to the Common Land project. So they, they were quite interested to to try to to adapt uh, their almond trees, which grow in the kind of altiplano in Andalusia, and see how they adapt with the with the climate frontier moving north. Why, why did you take their genetics? Is that a risk taking genetics from such a different climate, or you're sort of 
um, calculating that you might be in a similar climate or there was simply the best no, no, genetics no, no, around? No, we in a similar climate. But you're going to uh, be, or what, what, what was the reasoning going for, for no, their genetics? They, they have many different uh, varieties and ah, okay. you, you've, you've got blooming calendars produced by different uh, research centers in Spain. You've got uh, IRTA in Catalonia, you've got Sebas in Murcia. And what we planted was, um, of course, late blooming varieties because as you've seen in the, the past two years in France, we had a terrible late frost. Uh, and we've taken varieties, we've planted varieties that bloom in, in April. And in April, already in Toulouse, the, 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 uh, the frost risk is much more reduced than in this, and then in March. So, and plus it's mitigated. They're, they're, they're much further south, but, uh, they're at a higher altitude. And even Castilla-La mm -hmm. Mancha this year, Castilla-La Mancha is right in the center of Spain, but, uh, the altitude is much higher, 600 meters, and they, they, they suffered from late frost, uh, this year as well. And so we're a couple of months in now. How, how is, I mean, it's difficult to say something, obviously, but how, how have the trees been? Uh, the, the, the trees have behaved quite well. We've got, uh, a very high germination, uh, rate. Um, a few losses. We're still counting the losses and, uh, the nursery. If you, if, if the nursery helps you plant, normally you have a contract with the nursery where they guarantee kind of 100 germination of the plants. I mean, what you call a première feuille, first leaf. Then if it gets eaten by animals, of course, they won't replace them. <laughs> it's a different story. Um, um, so now they're, they're doing well. The, the, the growth is good. Um, and we've planted, uh, we were lucky to, to have, uh, the, the, the maif help us with the, the structure of the project. They have s some passes were quite, uh, higher, had a high clay content. And we've had to drain some of them. This was taken care of by the, the Maif. And, uh, we, we've started with the most suitable areas, which are in Spanish, say Franco Arenoso, which is quite, uh, the quite sandy soils. Because, uh, what there's one thing that almond trees hate is really, uh, being swimming in water, having the root system, uh, in, in water. So you get, uh, root asphyxia. So you want to make sure that water flows. And if you have drains, you're safe. So now the trees, you, what you do, you plant them. They, they come, uh, at, uh, they, they come at a height of one meter 20. That's what's guaranteed. And then you, you kind of have your first kind of formation pruning. You prune them back to 90 centimeters. You pull, you plant, uh, you plant them with a tutor. You put a protector against uh, rodents. Uh, and here you go. And, so and what kind of prep uh, have you done? Like, like what kind of? Uh, soil prep. What, what did you do to make sure that you have the highest chance uh, of, of your yeah, long-term, long-term success? There was a, after 30 years of, uh, intense, I mean, cropping, I can imagine, yeah. There was a, a compactation soil 80 centimeters, uh, below ground. So what you have to do is take, uh, what we call in French, le, le reaper, or you have to plow, you got, have to go for a deep plow. And then kind of, so you have to, you have to start tilling. You, you, you till once, but big time. And then it's going to be uh, with cover crops. So at, at some point, uh, it won't be touched anymore. Well, you, you do that once, you kind of uh, break that uh, soil. So you let the root system go deeper. Uh, and then you, you have, uh, you kind of clean it. You, 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 you with the, with your machinery. And then it's, it, it becomes your orchard. That's it. And, and what are the, the other, let's say, management practices you're putting in place? You mentioned uh, cover crops. Are you going to do any grazing? What's going to happen in between the lines? What, what, how close yeah, are they? What, what's, grazing, what's, what are you looking we're, we're, at? We're not there yet because, frankly speaking, we're, we're in an area which is slightly more humid than the rest. So already uh, farming organically uh, in an area which is less dry will have, I think, a few more treatments to anticipate possible fungus or uh, use mm -hmm. copper. You, you get to use what four kilos a, a year max per hectare. That's the rule in France. So we're not there yet. We've discussed uh, we're going to, of course, uh, put some beehives three to four per hectare because although we have uh, self uh, pollinating or how you call them auto fertile, auto fertile mm -hmm. varieties, you, you do increase your yield by putting beehives. It makes it better. And I think there's only one, uh, species of sheep that doesn't eat your your trees it's the shropshire sheep but uh we won't test it this year we'll have to wait a bit you cannot do unless it's a demonstration plot 
you cannot do everything. Uh, no, 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 no. But like long term, how do you would you like to see? No, no long let's term, say the orchard develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Long term, we want to, to to keep it as a pure pure organic um, pure organic orchard. With basically, we we've planted lots of hedges because it was completely flat, and we got a grant from the Caisse de Depot to plant hedges and maybe one hectare as well of uh, kind of how could we call it a a climate adaptation uh, research orchard, a kind of pilot orchard to take some different varieties from from Spain and kind of compare the um, flowering blooming calendars with valleys that are further south and see how it evolves but no i think the reality is going to be uh quite classic uh full full cover crops which gives you the highest uh, score in carbon hedges or what you call them multifunctional hedges so sometimes it's good for auxiliaries uh, um and yeah quite quite simple so on the in we would like to farm some in between maybe lavender but today it's uh you, we still have to to control the the old the old weeds from uh from the previous user and and how did you structure it as as an investment or how did you structure because you didn't you didn't buy the land as you mentioned before but then i mean all this planting obviously comes comes at a cost so as as a developer like how how did you structure this and how easy or difficult was it to find uh, the money to 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 get it into the ground basically and it's 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 taken time and I, i've always been um maybe back to what we saw uh, i i always thought that you in agriculture especially tree crops where there's a pretty long and deep jacob you need to be disciplined and not pay yourself uh, in france we've got a system which is called macron d'émission en conversion so i resigned from uh the UN backed fund and had two years of a kind of reduced salary paid to launch my, my venture. And we raised uh, roughly 1 million in equity because, oh, it looks like it's a very good idea on paper that you have someone else uh, buy the land for you and lease it to you. But once you go see the bank, the bank has no collateral. <laughs> so they say, okay. It's good that you're starting and uh, that someone has uh, bought the land for you, but what can you put as collateral uh, against that loan? So basically, capex is quite high eh? in tree crops. It's between ten to fifteen thousand euros per hectare. So it, it quickly becomes a, a two three million euro project. So one million equity. We just got one million in debt from uh, a syndicate of French banks made of Crédit Agricole and uh, Banque Populaire. But because they did not know almond uh, trees really well, uh, it's more in Provence. In Toulouse, we, are, we think we're, we're the newbies. So they thought that the risk was too important. So they, they made sure that they could apply bank guarantees from the European Investment Fund, from the European Investment Bank, to basically uh, secure, the, uh, secure the, the loan. So they've got 80% first loss. It's called Guarantee Enough uh, in France. Um, it's a program. So banks basically apply to the European Investment Fund, and they apply guarantees on the back of the loans they disburse, and then so they don't take any risk, basically. No, uh, very little, very little. No, because um, Martin, my co-founder, and I we are we are twenty percent second loss guarantors. So it's uh, for them. It's uh, it's they they finance innovation. Um, but uh, they, they, they didn't want to uh, kind of take a, such a high risk. And they asked us, that's good for the carbon additionality, they, they asked us to basically uh, put, the, put the carbon, not as collateral, but they said that we needed to do the carbon project and kind of uh, submit our carbon um, application to the French uh, government to get certified. So we did and, it. And that and carbon certification actually, yeah, is, the, is the, crucial for, for, the, for the numbers. Is that, is that quite developed in no, France? No, we, 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 we have an estimated 4,500 tons uh, of CO2 emission reduction. Uh, and at a price today, I think in France, you can sell the label by carbon for roughly 50 euros a, a ton. So that's 200K. And so that's, that's 10% of your capex and opex until yeah. you, you reach your kind of cash flow positive so it's not even a cherry on the cake but 
it makes it look good and uh, it shows that we've made the effort to to submit we've been good schoolboys with the with the french ministry and how how do you see this develop like oh, i think if developers are listening like from the renewable energy space they will recognize if they've been around 30 years ago or 20 years ago like but how do you see this going like this was the first one which is always the most difficult not only from the ergonomic perspective but also from the finance perspective how would you see a second or third these projects how would they ideally be financed or structured i i believe you need to take advantage of um long term debts when it exists and uh, of cheap debts well it, this has been the market conditions for the past uh, few years i've got no clue if this will these conditions will prevail in the future so that's the that, that's the the problem but again back to some uh, some people you had on the podcast i think you you really need to talk to investors uh who have in mind that you need patient uh, capital it's not for vcs who want to invest into nfts or the metaverse i mean it's a it's a different ball game uh especially with tree crops annual crops you maybe if you work well within two three years uh, you're in cruising speed tree crops you you, you get your first harvest uh in almond that you um you know uh, you get a symbolic harvest at year three, four, five, five, six. You're increasing speed depending on your planting density. If it's uh, walnuts, I think it's close to ten years. Same with pistachios, hazelnuts. Uh, it's maybe close to almonds. So you you you, you need. It's quite classic. You need a. Um, I think the gearing ratios are roughly fifty fifty. If you put one in equity, one in debt is uh, is fine. And once once it's in cruising speed. Why not uh, have more more debt on the operation? But you have to be very conservative and especially uh, have people not pay themselves too much at the beginning. I think that's a, it's it's a rule for every entrepreneur. You have to bootstrap your your company, but especially in agriculture, people you have to be you have to be stingy <laughs> to succeed. And so you are. What, what does the next phase now look like? Apart from obviously managing this farm, making sure that as many trees make it as possible in, in the best possible shape, the cover crops uh, get on, the arable one as well. You're looking at next projects. Well, what is what is next in terms of uh, the Green Pots uh, initiative? Because I'm imagining you didn't raise 1 million in equity for, for one farm in Toulouse. Yeah, but this is at SPV uh, level. Yeah, maybe it's, it was a bit too much, but at the beginning you have to, um, that, that's how you you can convince your investors especially you can convince your banks especially if you don't have the if you don't have the um the, the land to put it as collateral huh? so no i think now the um the idea is to to, to scale uh not to scale uh, uh we're not planning to 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 build a unicorn that's not the uh the idea so but many people to, are gonna stop listening now no i'm joking <laughs> no, the, the the idea is really to to reach a certain scale. I cannot tell you how big uh, that scale is to uh, to get some interest and to be able to have bargaining power with uh, maybe mm, distributors or large retail players, so they listen to you. Because when when you're small, even seventy hectares it looks big in France for an almond orchard, but it's it's gardening compared to. Uh, what the Americans can do with a farm like uh, a company like Pomona, which has got 40,000 hectares under management. Um, so I don't know. We, we'd like to maybe, uh, secure could be a lease. It could be, a could be a purchase. Mm, not the same structure then, of course, in financial terms, reach 500,000 hectares and, uh, and plant it. And I think best is to have a portfolio, uh, I like um, yeah nuts because they're non-perishable. So it reminds me of my years in coffee and cocoa. You can store them. I wouldn't be able to do uh, yeah fresh fruit because I think uh, it, it, there's a certain anxiety after 24 hours. You know that you've yeah. only got 24 more hours left before it rots. So uh, I'll stay away from this business. It's for really uh, artists. Um, and yeah, a portfolio of farms, um, the idea of green pods is to scale and build a portfolio of farms in Europe to basically, uh, contribute to uh, food security, um, food security, um, substitutes our own production to imports. And uh, the, the statistics are crazy. If, if we enter that, uh, discussion, I think France has doubled its, uh, fruit and veg imports over the past 10 years. 
So it's it's Which really uh, insane. No, it's, yeah. it's it's a lot. And and are you scared of? I mean, scared? Do you see climate change as a risk as long term fruit trees, or in this case, the the um, tree nuts? And they take a while and they, it's not really easy to move or possible. So what would you say, like if investors are like, yeah, I mean, annuals, you can, you can adjust quite quickly. At this case, you're, you're sort of stuck for the next 20 years. How, how do you anticipate on, on the risk True. of climate change? <laughs> Toulouse just went through, I think, 40 degrees last week for the first time ever. And, um, so what's, what's your answer when somebody raises that question? Of course, we've had it uh, raised in more than one time. Um, I think you need to have a certain uh, water policy. You, you, you need to make sure that you, what you draw on the water reserves is sustainable in the sense that you should not dig wells. You should uh, draw onto uh, basically surface waters, which are renewable. And today, this is the case with uh, the... the, the um, uh, the river basins of La Garonne or even the Ebro River in northern Spain. You've got ample precipitation on the Pyrenees. There's rain, there's snow, you have snow melts, then it gets back into the rivers. And basically, we, we get water from uh, Le Canal de saint martory which dates back to Napoleon III, because you had overflows at uh, during the meltdown from the Pyrenees in La Garonne. And this was made to divert that overflow and bring it to roughly 30,000 hectares that are being irrigated around the farm. So this is really important. That's why, I, of course, I, I wouldn't go today uh, to, to, to the south or some people are going to Morocco. I think that's quite a risky bet. I think it's it's interesting to anticipate the climate frontier moving north uh, a bit. Don't plant almonds uh, in Scotland today, but there's certainly a, a trend. It's pretty hard to quantify. Um, and yeah, uh, I think you're, you're, again, blue water withdrawal, and it's one of the criteria of the OP2B in the region act definition. In the US, they, they, they use 12,000 cubic meters of water to irrigate one hectare of almonds. Uh, we've only got, uh, a, a, a limited, we've, we've got a, we call it la dotation. We get, uh, we get an allowance of 6,000 cubic meters per year. So you can already see that between, the, the French um, approach and the American approach, you've got a difference, which is basically mandatory. It's just regulatory. We, 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 we just see, have, yeah. yeah, we see water used in a different manner. And in France, you cannot build, uh, it's impossible to build a, a, a kind of water storage unit. You, you, you need to use what you get. And if there are water shortages, you can count on the head of region or sorry, the préfet uh so it's at department level to to put on some restrictions and this year in spain some farms which had water rights up to 8000 cubic meters have been restricted down to 1750 cubic meters around the on the golalquivir river basins close to sevilla so this is really it's coming long. yeah it's real and and for you like the 6000 in your calculations of course it's difficult to know now is that more, just to get an understanding, is that more than enough? Is that way too much? Like you can easily make it, it's nice if it's there, but you can easily make it with way less. Like do you have that in, in well, this the, kind of the, system? The, do you have that flexibility to, to let's say it gets half? Are you in deep yeah, trouble? There's, or? A, there's a very good graph produced by the Catalonia Research Center with um, water use and yield when it comes to tree crops. It's, it's, the correlation is one to one. And the more water you use, the better the yield. But at some point, there's a bit of a plateau in the sense that at 6,000 uh, cubic meters, I think you've got the optimal uh, irrigation. Okay. If, if you apply seven or eight, you're, you're going to be wasting a lot of water, but you're, you're not increasing the yield. It's, it's, it's just a marginal increase. So I think this is the right, uh, this is the, it's our sweet spot. You can always discuss mm -hmm. it uh, maybe a, a bit less. And in case there's no more water one day, you have to think it. Uh, this is really the crash test. We've planted with uh, densities of uh, six by three. So that's roughly 550 trees per hectare. If things go wrong, you can always take out one tree out of two in the row. You get back into six by six and six by six is very close to the classical uh, Andalusia Spanish density, which is kind of family farming with no irrigation whatsoever. 
low yield, low input, low, low, low input, low output. And that's what you get. So the, I think you need to have a kind of, uh, escape, uh, escape scenario where you, you get back to, uh, non-irrigated. Well, I hope not. Uh-huh. No, no, of course. But I mean, it's, it's been, it's been asked, of course. Yeah, it's been asked and, and you need to, to, to at least be ready and hope that it never happens. But, uh, but, it's, but then uh, you really get into a, a low yield system. You can reach yields of 1.5 tons in organic, even higher, uh, per hectare. But if you don't irrigate your, it's a tree that's kind of alternates from year to year, bumper crop, then low crop. Um, and if, if you don't have, uh, irrigation, it, it gets, um, even, even, uh, harder. So you could, you could get yields down to 300 kilos, 400 kilos per hectare. So then you, you, you know, you're not going to be touching it much. Huh? And then what are you y- planning? Like in terms of, of yields, what are you modeling with? I, I, I think, uh, I th- I think between a ton, uh, 1.5 tons, it's, it's very early to say, but you, you got people who, who manage this quite well. You can, I've seen Spaniards reach, uh, two tons per hectare in organic in six by three. And it's not today you see a, a method called a super high density, uh, of production mode. They call it super intensive where, where it basically hedges. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. And they go over it with the machine, yeah, 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 and and you can just harvest with a with a with a machine. Well, this is a different model, and what we see that some people are already thinking that it might be a bit too extreme in the sense that your kind of yield curve goes down quite quickly when you when you're farming traditionally. You can an orchard can last for forty years. I think it lasts for twenty five if you're doing semi intensive. But if you go super intensive. You might have a, a shorter lifespan for your orchard, which is, I mean, which is something that you can model in, like if it makes sense in that sense. I and mean, of course, it's extremely high input. We, we've had some discussions on here, and I've had some other discussions. Um, shout out to Dimitri of the Region Agroforestry podcast on, like, I think what would be very interesting as well is to test that. How can you make that as I wouldn't even say regenerative because that sort of suggests that it's a thing, but how how can you apply as many as some of the world is moving to high intensive, like what would that look like if you take uh, extreme biodiversity measures, soil health, et cetera, like would that be possible? And yes, maybe the, 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 the hedge is only last 10 years or 15 years, but you can, you can model that in, like would that even be possible to do it um, without all the chemical input that it currently needs and all the water it currently needs? And what would that look like? And I don't know, I don't think, I don't know if anybody did it yet. Uh, there aren't people trying, there are trials in super intensive inorganic and without irrigation uh and i think it's uh let's see but i i from what i understand and from what i've seen in all the orchards i have visited i've, I've driven seven several thousand kilometers between france and spain the super intensive model works well under steroids but if you if you switch it to organic uh, it gets confused and you, you don't get much huh? because you've got all these um porta injerto you've got all these uh rootstocks which are called nanizante they're dwarfing rootstocks mm-hmm. uh and they, they 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 need to be pumped up so the tree grows so you need the root you need a bigger root system to uh, to theoretically make that work and then what what is so it no, when you're farming organic you have less yeah. choices with uh yeah. with fertilization with uh yeah. so you need more vigorous rootstocks on which you graft uh whatever right you you want but today you've got two main rootstocks in in almonds which are the uh gf677 uh which is a prunus and uh another garnem when you have a bit more fungus in your soil but the 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 rootstocks for for super intensive are totally different this is much more the from what i understand it's much more about being the apprentice sorcerer than uh the classic uh rootstocks you have that are just being multiplied in every nursery that you can find and and the high intensive guys and girls are saying, yeah, we, we need to do this because um, because of labor shortages. We need to automate automate. We need to be able to drive over it with a with a machine and harvest and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that like how is that an, a thing in the almonds? I know it's a thing in the in the olive space, or some people call it a thing. Is the labor shortages are is that something you uh, you're planning with is that an issue in the organic almond industry in in france or not at all 
it's true that you need to mechanize in order to be competitive because in Northern Europe, we are not the, the cheapest. Uh, our friends in the South, uh, sometimes are cheaper. So yes, you, you, you need, that's, that's a constraint. And there is as well a constraint of scale or size is that, uh, tree crop machinery works well. If you want to make sure that you, you, you pay it back, you, you, Working with 50 hectare blocks uh, economically makes sense. If you've only got 20, uh, it's going to be hard to invest into all the machinery because if you need to have a, a tractor that costs you 90,000 euros, you need a sprayer, then you need the, a harvesting machine. You can always adapt and kind of do it the, the Soviet way, as we call it, but uh, no, no, it's, you, you need a certain scale. You need scale. Yeah. You, 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 you need parcels that are not, not too small because if... Uh, if your tractor guy has to uh, turn every 30 meters, uh, you just go crazy. Plus, you know, you have to leave uh, eight meters on the sides to make sure that you have a, a comfortable space for a U-turn. So y your parcels need to, to be of a certain size. And of course, a, a square is better than uh, some kind of a crazy artistic parcel. Which many places are, and, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Totally, yeah. And so how do you see that? What do, what do you see in, in the future of mechanization? Is it going to be lighter and smaller and and you don't need eight meters anymore to turn they're going to be i mean everybody's talking about autonomous robotics etc do you see anything yet in the nuts tree space or is that all a pipe dream well what you see uh is crazy i've seen some israeli startups that can uh, harvest your your apples with drones there they, they just i've seen it too and, and come and suck up your your, your apple uh this is quite crazy. I don't know at what cost it comes, but uh, no, if there's one thing uh, I would dream of is, of course, uh, electric trackers, tractors. I think they're, they're still not, the technology is still not there yet, or maybe it's just too expensive because uh, that, that's, that's, uh, they're if coming, you do they're your, coming. If you do Shout your, out to Michael Herzer, I will put one uh, link. He, he, he has to come on the show soon. Uh, he's yeah, building. In, uh, in the current one. calculation, the, the, the 190 liters or 200 liters of diesel per hectare that you burn every year, they, they, you can feel them in the current calculation. You would be much, much better off with a, with an electric tractor. That's one thing. We have used, uh, a, we've had some trials with Agrin Culture, um, which is a Toulouse based startup. Uh, and they have robots to basically mow in between rows. We did a demo, uh, at the farm the other day. Still not enough autonomy, same thing when it comes to electric, so they have a hybrid engine. Uh, but looking very good, and it's true that someone working, there's so much work to do uh, on a farm that just going back and forth to do the, the mowing and the mulching of the, 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 the weeds that grow crazy every two weeks. I mean, if we can send rockets to space, I, I really hope that we can have uh, automated lawn mowers that have the farmer or the farm manager sleep in the morning with the or do something else because you've got you've got your irrigation you've got you've always got a pump that goes wrong uh, the day the day we had the heat in Toulouse of course uh, the SD card of the of the of the pumps went wrong uh, so you always get things to to fix so spending time uh, shooting driving back CO2, and forth more or less yeah, the same. shooting CO2 a diesel the, tractor yeah. shooting CO two in the sky while you're trying to capture CO2 with your tree crops, that, that's, that's something I really hope we can get out of in the next five or 10 years. Plus the, the silence is good. You, you do get some for permaculture or horticulture. You do, you get very nice French tractors called the Sabi Agri. They look like the lunar rover. Fantastic. But the autonomy. Yeah, and, so a... Nayo, and there, there's some, there, they're definitely coming. Um, but yeah, the silence would be, would be nice as well, actually, in the countryside. No, so yeah. You might hear the, you might hear the birds and the, and, and the insects. Yeah, exactly. So, no, not today, uh, you, I think we're trying to be, uh, at, at the edge of technology. We're not a, we're not a tech company. We're trying to just speak to the, to the best and, uh, and say, look, if, if you want to try your solution, please come to the farm. So Genesis Soil Health has done the baseline of the, of our soils. So they've got different, uh, they've got different, Marks, they, 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 they've got diff different criteria they look at. So you've got, uh, you've got your soil organic carbon, of course. You've got bacteria diversity. You've got oxygen availability, zinc, uh, contamination, uh, chrome, cadmium, anything. So, and the baseline is quite bad. So we hope that with all the prunings of the trees that we'll do, uh, by, by not tilling, uh, 
we hope that no, we don't hope. We're pretty sure that the the we'll do much better than the baseline because we we started really low. And you already mentioned one thing that might, that might not be the the, the crucial one. Uh, if you had a magic wand thing, you could change one thing overnight. So you had one wish that could go that would change in in food and agriculture. What would that be? It could be anything from a carbon tax to better taste to stop crazy imports to electric tractors. And um, but you only can choose one thing. What would that be? Oh, well, it's, it's a hard question. Um, I, I, I would, um, I would uh, ask people to reallocate some of their disposable income to to food. I am not a communist. My family left the Soviet Union, but I, 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 I think that people have forgotten that you've got lots of different ecosystem services uh, provided by agriculture between water regulation, uh, air regulation, CO two capture that. I can't remember these these statistics. I don't have them. They're quite famous. That in the fifties, maybe uh, the, the the share of disposable income that a household would put in its food was thirty percent, and now it's maybe less than ten because most of it is uh, real estate or other things. And and food has got much more value in it than just um, feeding people. That's uh, well, we've tried and in France. We've got the loi Galim. Uh, you can, we've tried to protect farmers to have some kind of cost based cost plus uh, based uh, formula so people are not allowed or retailers are allowed to buy at a price lower than the kind of production cost of the farmer but i think this is one um, because the economy is crazy you've got bubbles uh, on uh, on the internet on uh, on nft on marketplaces and i still think as uh, everybody says it uh, you, you need to see a farmer three times a day to um, to feed yourself so it is a socially important uh, job that has to be valued so uh, i i think um i would i would campaign for 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 giving more revenues to all people who farm because today i think it's in a modern country in a sorry in a uh, in a developed economy it's 2% of um of gdp Agriculture, primary production, huh? not agribusiness, and what co- goes with it. No, that that's where the, the real money is, but the the the, the direct yeah, exactly. money going P- to far, farms is, and land is nothing. Yeah. And primary production, uh, primary Keeps production is not yeah. financed enough in the sense that uh, uh, for a continent like Africa, I think maybe forty percent of the population is still rural, a bit less. Twenty five percent of GDP or thirty percent of GDP comes from agriculture. And you got less than five percent uh, exposure to ag in banks portfolio. So this is where the money needs to flow. It's primary production. Uh, I think it's socially important. Uh, that's what the UN have uh, told me. The, I, I didn't invent the statistics, and it's it, it's vital and it's uh, it's useful. And we we see with what with, with what's happening today uh, in Ukraine. And so, what would you tell? Let's say we're in a in a theater full of uh, of, of quote unquote smart investors. Uh, both investing their own money, working in the finance sector. I mean, you've met many of these in, in the past. Uh, what would you leave them with? We're on stage, we're, we're hosting an evening, and we're doing this in person, which I hope will happen at some point. Um, what would you leave them with as, as a message? Obviously not giving investment advice, but what, what would you like them to do or where to start looking and hopefully investing and putting money to work when they, once they leave that theater? Uh, di- 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 divest from sectors which uh, are not helping the planet for, for one thing that's but you've already got a, a, a eu taxonomy i think that they'll be under higher pressure you've got some champions you've got some very good uh, impact uh, investors you've got some good esg investors i still i wouldn't be able to quantify what their share of the market or of asset management is i would guess still quite small and very biased again because I've worked in uh, agriculture all my life. But it's in this sector, invest money in this sector, and especially in primary production because that's where it's needed. Uh, maybe stop thinking of uh, double or not triple digit returns. That's but don't expect paybacks in two years with super high yield because that that's actually uh, not the case. Although you, you can make good money, but. Yeah, just to be clear, like you're you're not in this for for charity. You're predicting and hopefully you realizing can make, you can good make returns. Very good money, uh, and that's maybe not very European. But uh, orchards are being traded by uh, North American funds, uh, and they're very happy with their their returns. Huh? 
And so what would you do if you are in charge of, a, let's say, a, a 1 billion euro investment fund tomorrow morning? What would you allocate it to? Or not, not down to the euro, but what, what would you focus on? Would it be all nut tree crops? Would it be some, some, some percentage of experimental things, some technology? And what would you, if you had the longest time horizon possible, what would you prioritize if you had to put 1 billion euros to work? First, I would, I would choose a geography that I love, which is Central Asia. You've got Uzbekistan, you've got Tajikistan, you've got plenty of water in the Himalayas, two huge rivers flowing, which, called, which are called the Amudari and Sirdaria. And with 1 billion and 50,000 uh, euro capex, I think you could do what? I'm missing this years. 200,000 or not 20,000 hectares, or you could do a lot. And I would do, I would do orchards because back in the days it was uh, an intensive uh, cotton monoculture that uh, has ruined the RLC. That's that's my first um, impression. So you buy land of, and build orchards. Yeah. Well, you don't no need to buy land. Uh, Long term, land can stay with the government. I'm, I'm completely agnostic. I think land sometimes can be totally separated from the operating company. Uh, I think it's uh, unless you have to talk to a bank. Yeah. <laughs> But you don't have exactly. to do it. In this so case, where, you don't have to do where's that. Where's your collateral? Um, but <laughs> in this case, no, you don't need them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. And of course, uh, we discussed investors. Back to your previous question, uh, the, the layered fund structures that some funds have is very, is very clever because if the public sector cannot subsidize everything, sometimes when they put uh, 5 or 10% at the bottom of a cash flow waterfall and they, and, and they are junior to all the rest of the investors, the investors are very happy to go into a new asset class, which they would not dare enter on their own. So that's what big investors can do, like the EIB or the World Bank. So this is, a, and especially for a, a, a region like Central Asia, where it's still perceived as very risky, and it's much less risky than it was at the fall of the Soviet Union. So it, it, it's interesting. And again, tree crops, not, not, not because it's green pots, just because I've worked in this space for, for, for many years, even before. And we have forgotten, we always insist uh, in France on horticulture and permaculture, but tree crops, we've, we, we, we've lost some acreage as well. I think it was maybe two and a half or three percent of our, of our agricultural surface. We've lost, I think, one percentage point on this. And re relegating these crops to Europe, uh, they capture carbon. Uh, it's pretty easy to follow good practice you, because you, you very quickly you will, you will stop tilling. You will, make your soil better, you will bring back biodiversity because there's much more biodiversity in an orchard uh, than in a, basically in a cornfield. And you contribute to the much needed shift towards plant-based diets instead of having uh, basically uh, soy feeding animals that are then feed, fed to us. Or so corn ship to Spain to fed yeah, pigs. Or, yeah, or ship, 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 ship our yeah. corn to Spain so they ship back pork to us. Uh, not, nothing against uh, pig farmers, uh, but maybe in the future we won't be able to, to to keep doing this. And and what would you tell? I hear a lot of people, or a lot of people, reach out uh, to like, okay, I want to. I don't have a farming background, or I do, and I have some experience now, and and I want to get active in this space. It's very difficult to give career advice, obviously, but what would you tell them? Like, focus on tree crops, um, focus on the project development. What what do you think feel as the sort of missing piece um, out there that, that's really missing in, in the region X space? I would say that practice is, is important. Uh, before you launch yourself into a product or it's tempting to, to leave your full-time job, it's always good to, um, to experiment uh, and to do it. If you have some savings, just plant a hectare or two with a friend. That's how we started with Martin. We tried to plant pistachios at his uh, uncle's farm. Uh, for some reasons, we decided to do something else, but um, it, it's important to, to, to give it a, a proper try. You might not like it, so you might love it, uh, you might very, very become very good at it. So, And this was actually the point of uh, I had uh, with Martin when we started. Many people were coming with concept notes with no background in farming. And as an investor, of course, that, that's, a, that's a red flag, immediate red flag. Say, oh, okay, that's, uh, that's too ambitious, no track record. That's the first reaction of every investor. So if you develop, albeit small, a pilot, and that you can show a pilot that is clean, then replicating, a, okay, it's a changing a, the scale of the business can change the, the, the nature, but I think it's a very good start. 
and le- 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 leasing a hectare of land somewhere with a with, with, with some friends, uh, you can do it. I think it's a it's a great advice, and I might add this question to uh, as a regular question because it's uh, it's something to. I think we need more energy, more people. We need more people on the land for sure. We need more people connected to the land, and and through agriculture, that's that's one of the best ways to do that. I want to be conscious of your time, and and thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I would say early in the journey of green pots, but obviously not early in your journey into into tree crops, into agriculture, into finance. And I'm looking forward to to check in. Um, how it's been developing and, and where the next farms will be and how you're going to grow to 500 to 1,000 hectares, uh, etc. And, and of course, grow a lot of uh, tree nuts in the, in the process. Sure. No, thank you very much for having me um, and look forward to, to being in touch and uh, speak soon then. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links discussed, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash post. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.